Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you all with us today. Founderline is all about helping people with their startups. So maybe you're someone who's thinking about starting a company and you have some questions, or maybe you've already started a company and you're encountering some situations that you need help with. Um, you might be someone who's thinking about joining a startup and you have some questions before you decide to accept an offer. In any of those cases, uh, we're here for you. We wanna try to help you if we can today. Uh, this is a live show, which means we're available right now to take your questions and try and answer them. Uh, the best ways to reach us are via email. Our email address is help at founderline.com. Uh, and you can also reach us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Jessica Livingston, who is a founding partner at Y Combinator, which is a seed stage investment fund in Mountain View that's funded more than 800 startups, including Dropbox, Airbnb, Stripe, and Reddit. She is also the author of this best-selling book called Founders at Work. You can go get it on Amazon right now if you want to. And she's the organizer of the annual Female Founders Conference. Uh, Jessica, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Joe. It's I'm so great to, to have here. you here today. Um, so, uh, you know, before we dive in, I usually ask just a couple of warm-up questions just to, you All know, right. get the get the mental juices flowing there. And um, uh, you know, I was, I was doing some homework on you guys and looking back, and you know, you, you all started YC about 10 years ago, right? Yeah, As of 10 March, years ago. Which is amazing. Um, 800 companies funded, billions of dollars in, you know, market cap created, um, and, it, you know, which is just a, a, a great accomplishment. But, you know, I was thinking back to those early days, like, you know, there's four of you starting it, I believe, um, back in Cambridge, and may mm -hmm. maybe take us back there and share a little bit about the earliest days of YC, like, what was it like? Yeah, well, you have to remember it was an entirely different time back then, in 2004 and early 2005. Um, back then, if a founder wanted to get any type of funding, um, you either had to be far enough along to go get money from a venture capitalist who yeah. wanted to put in millions, or you had to find sort of a rich uncle That's or, right. or a rich friend. Um, there was no sort of first option, really. Um, so back in those days, you know, Paul um, had had a had via web and had exited, and he had always wanted to be an angel investor, mm. but he didn't want to get involved in all the things that angel investors have to do, like get pitched and review <laughs> pitches and all that kind of thing. So anyway, we just were talking at that time. We were dating, and we'd spent a lot of time talking about how broken um, funding was for for founders, and we realized we, as we were talking that we we thought that there should be a um, a standardized form of seed funding hmm. where you knew you could just go and you'd get this amount of money and they'd take this much equity and they'd help you with your legal documents and stuff. Um, based on his experience actually at ViaWeb, their first investor gave them $10,000 for 10% of the company. Wow. Um, and he did all their legal paperwork because he was a lawyer, but actually Paul thought that was a great deal because he wouldn't have gotten started without that. Yep. Um, so we knew there needed to be a standardized form of funding and we knew it should be branded because it was just so random um, back then and yep. there wasn't w one place to go. So we said, we want to be the place to go. So our original idea was that We'd start um, an investment company and we'd fund companies asynchronously like they were normally funded. As they came in. Yeah. But we also realized, gosh, so Paul and I decided to do this and we and we roped in then Robert and Trevor, who were Paul's original co-founders from ViaWeb, but we all said, we don't know how to do angel funding. We better learn. So the timing was right that we said, let's learn by funding a whole batch of startups this summer. And we'll like wow. try to, you know, appeal to um, undergrads, CS undergrads, and they can come do a summer founders program in Cambridge with us this summer. We'll fund a batch and then we'll, as a result, learn a lot about angel investing and then we'll go back to funding wow. asynchronously. So that's where so the batch came from. Was that's where the batch came from. It was a complete accident. Um, Paul had a, a bunch of followers because he was wrote a lot of essays. So we got 200 applications. We funded eight 
startups in that batch, including Sam Altman, who is now the president of Y Combinator. Right. He was in our first batch. And very quickly, we realized how powerful it was to fund companies in a batch because they were kind of each other's colleagues. Even though they didn't all work out of our office, they helped each other with, other with problems. We could bring them together and have guest speakers. We had the Tuesday night dinners. It was very similar to what we do now. Wow. And just as a final thought, I'll throw in how crazy our idea seemed and how our lawyers you know, advised us like not to do this idea because the VCs would just wash us out because we were taking common stock and oh. all of that. And no one really understood what we were trying to do. Um, but it worked. That's <laughs> we just awesome. kept going from that's, there. That's, that's great insight. And, and obviously, you know, seed investing as a category has evolved so much. Oh, yeah. You know, the cost to do a company has gone down dramatically. Uh, j just getting off the ground is orders of magnitude less expensive and less, less complicated than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe talk about in the 10 years you guys have been doing this how how has you know seed investing evolved and what you see you know coming in the future well you know the simplest way it's changed is just the numbers have gotten a lot bigger. Um, you know, seed investing back when we were doing it, I mean, we were we started out giving $12,000 yep. to a, a, a startup, which, you know, looking back isn't very much money. Um, but now, you know, you referred to a seed round, that can be a million bucks, you know, two million bucks. I know, I've heard of like up cases. to three million, right? Um, yeah, and back then in, you know, 05, 06, we sort of viewed ourselves as first gear, um, and then we viewed second gear with like two hundred and fifty thousand right. dollars was a fine round to raise right, right after right. Y Combinator. It was just um, not as much money thrown around. Um, and now they're just there's a lot more angels in the world, um, which which makes it great for founders to get into that second gear, yep. even if it's with two million dollars. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the big change is that there are just a lot more players and, and the dollar figures are going up and certainly the valuations are going up quite it's, a bit. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and, it, and what I think is great is, you know, the, this stuff keeps getting plowed back into the soil, if you will, like like more companies are created, creating, mm -hmm. you know, more founders who can mm -hmm. put money back into more startups and, and you know, the cycle just continues. Right? Actually, that's one, one comment about that. Back in 2004, I think, Paul was giving a talk at Harvard University on how to start a startup, okay. um, which is one of his famous essays. And he said to the audience, you know, you should really try to, instead of trying to find your rich uncle, you should try to find someone who has made their own money through a startup because they'll be just give you valuable advice in addition to the money. Yep. And everyone in the off, in the audience sort of looked longingly at him and he <laughs> thought, wait, but don't come to me. <laughs> but not me. And he felt so guilty that he then realized he wanted to do angel investing. Oh, uh, that's funny. Yeah. That's great. That's classic Paul, right? Yeah. Um, well, so um, the last thing I, w I wanted to chat about a little bit is, um, you know, that there've been uh, a lot of conversations recently about the lack of women in Silicon Valley and sexism and all sorts of things. And one of the things you guys have tried to do recently, I think it's the last two years, the Female Founders Conference, right? Yeah. So, so tell us more about what you're trying to do there and what, mm -hmm. what you've seen so far in running it for the past couple of years. Yeah, oh yeah, it's one of my, my all-time favorite events. Um, so basically when I thought about how could I or Y Combinator um, help the you know women in tech problem the most? If how could what could we do to have the most impact? Yeah. Um, I sort of looked at it and I thought you know what we need to do? We need to fund fund more women, which means get more women to start startups and then apply to Y Combinator. Yeah. Um, so encourage more women to actually you know pull the trigger and start a startup fund them, and then help them become successful so that they can serve as role models. Because one of the biggest problems that I think there is is that there just aren't enough role models out there of successful female founders. Um, Absolutely. And I think that that's definitely growing. It you know takes a good few years before you get to the level where you're you know well-known and, and your company is successful. But anyway, that was sort of the premise, that we want to do more to showcase these female founders that we funded. 
So um, I'd been wanting to do something like this for years, but of course I'm pulled in three million directions yeah. and it just felt like I never had the time. And, and then I remember it was in December, Paul sent me an email and said, you know, Jess, we have enough, you know, successful female founders in YC. We have a quorum here to just do, you know, Y Combinator fa female founders type thing. I oh, said, cool. you know, you're absolutely right. I'm getting off my butt and I'm doing this. And this was, we, we planned the first one for, I think it was March of, of 2014. We did it here in Mountain View at the Computer History Museum. And it was really mostly all Y Combinator founders, there were about five, and then I also invited Julia Hartz of Eventbrite, because I always said for years, I said if I do you know, female founders conference, I'm inviting Julia, I'm gonna work yeah. around her schedule. Yeah. And Diane Green of VMware, who I admire tremendously, um, they came and, and participated in the event. And it was phenomenal. We had, I think, 500 attendees, all women, um, because my philosophy is I want to save every seat in the house for a woman because yeah. we can't inspire more women if they're not there. I know, I was jealous. Um, <laughs> I watched the, uh, the stream this year just to oh, like, check Oh, the videos, it out. whether you're male or female, you yeah. should watch the videos. Yeah. So it was a huge hit and it was very, I remember the, the feeling there was just very open and all the women, sh you know, talked very openly about their struggles, about their achievements, about the real deal. Um, even though we were being live streamed, it still felt very intimate. And, you know, the, the audience just left feeling very inspired, as was I. I said, we're definitely doing this again. This year, we did it in February. We um, had 900 attendees. Wow. Um, and we did it up in San Francisco, and again, um, mostly Y Combinator founders and then some special guest stars. But it's just every year you just walk away from this feeling like, wow, these women are amazing, and they've, you know, listening to their stories is is really, really great. And, and we're going to keep doing it. So annual events, that's yeah. the current plan? That and, is the uh, current plan. And you guys, this is all funded by you guys yes like, and yes anybody can attend and anyone can attend um, through an application process we have you know five questions we try to make it pretty easy it's free um, and you know we just want to reach as many women that we can and you know based on uh, our applications I think a lot of people who attended the female founders call conference some you know a bunch of them applied to YC which was which was great that, that's fantastic that inspired it's them. great it's great that you're doing that uh, aside from the work you're doing in general just to fund as many great startups as you can whether they're male yeah. or female founders right that's so, our uh, plan <laughs> awesome well um, why don't we take some questions and see if we can help great. some people out um, okay. remember you can email us uh, our email address is help at founderline.com or you can tweet questions to at Founderline. So um, let's jump in here. First question is uh, from Sophia at Stanford. Uh, so thank you, Sophia. Um, it says, you have defined YC's strong culture. What are some definitive steps that founders can take to define a lasting culture for their startups? Oh, well, um, yes, culture is very important to startups. And, and actually, it is one of the reasons, most people don't know this, but it's one of the reasons we deliberately did not create a traditional incubator where we had the startups work out of our offices mm. because we believe that culture starts when you're just two people you know, working in your garage or whatever. Yep. Yep. Um, and we, we wanted people to have that sort of grow organically. Um, their so own culture. Their as own opposed culture, to culture as opposed to our culture, okay. you know, in our office. Okay. Um, so I gave a talk actually at the Female Founders Conference um, and I, I put it online called uh, The Social Radar, What I Did at Y Combinator, because that's not something that I, I talk about much um, or I didn't, but um, culture was very important to Y Combinator. And what I mean by that is that you know, we always tried to fund people who we thought were smart and determined and had a great idea. Um, but we also tried to fund people who were nice. 
Um, and I'm not saying every single person we've ever funded is nice, but a majority of them are um, very nice. And we fostered a sense of community and helping each other, like you're all struggling right now, um, especially within the batches, right. um, help each other if you need help, you know, because you'll be helped someday. And we definitely try to instill that with our alumni. We say, you know, alumni helped you when you were going through Y Combinator, now it's your turn. Hmm. And so we have this, you know, very vibrant community of alumni who, you know, there's pretty much anyone on this alumni can answer a question or has encountered a problem um, that a lot of the new founders have. And so it's, it's a really, supportive community and I was just just this weekend actually we were up in Mendocino for our first ever Camp YC for alumni. It was people were in tents and hanging out and a, an alumni came up to me and he said I want to thank you for creating this wonderful community because I could go up to anyone here and I don't know them but I could have a great conversation with them. Hmm. Um, so that was sorry about Y Combinator's culture. How do you then um, be conscious of this when you're doing a startup. So as I said, it starts really early on, so you gotta be focused on it. I'm not saying you have to like, you know, you're trying to solve the product problem, so right. you don't have to sit there and be like, what's our culture, yeah, what's our culture? every day. Yeah, right? no, not at all, but you have to realize that it starts early. And when you're hiring your first few employees, they better be damn good yeah. because they are helping you set the culture of the company and the type of people that you hire. And um, you know, if you care about certain things, you got to be conscious about about it. if you really want to be, you know, careful about a work-life balance or something. You got to be very active in in setting this culture yeah, early absolutely. on because what gets started it's hard to change yeah. once you get you grow to a lot of people well and I, and I always tell people um, you know the the founders really set the stage for everyone who follows and so people you know lead by example mm -hmm. if, if they see you you know you leave every day at four o'clock and um, you know, you're not available for the rest of the day, and, you know, they mimic that, right? Absolutely. And, and, and if, if you're rude to people or if you're mean or whatever yep. it is, people Or a start, micromanager or something. Whatever it is, they sort of inherit the characteristics yep. of, of their leaders, right? So, Absolutely. Um, so I, I always tell people to just model what they would want to see in their companies. And um, it doesn't always work out, right? You you. Everybody makes hiring mistakes, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, in some cases, not even through anyone's fault. It's just right. a bad it just match. Doesn't work out. So, um, which actually is one um, important point. Um, when guest speakers come in, they all say, when we say, you know, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Like universally, the answer is not firing soon enough. Hmm. Um, and everyone has to fire people. It's just a natural thing when you're hiring so fast and growing at a startup. But you've got to, um, you know, fire someone if they're not working out. Yep. Um, and it's hard to do. Yep. It's hard to nobody, do. Nobody likes to no. know. I, I hate it. But, um, it, you know, you always you always feel better afterwards, especially mm -hmm. if you do a good job of it. You know, yeah. like you don't make it about them personally and try to, you know, make it as soft a landing as possible, mm -hmm. so. Um, and you don't want it to affect, in terms of culture, you don't want it to um, have create bad morale for yeah. the rest of your team. So Absolutely. you gotta just deal with it quickly. Absolutely, and usually it, it helps the morale, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it, by the time you find out as the CEO, <laughs> like everyone else knows and, and you know, they're like, oh, all right, that, I'm glad they, they finally dealt with that. So, um, so Sophia, I hope, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, Let's move on. We've got another one here. Uh, this person is called Always Be Coding from Washington, mm, D.C. I like it. So uh, he says, or he or she, um, been working on a startup for six months building a consumer app. Things are going well, good product, and good user traction. The problem is that we're almost completely out of money, and it's clearly too early for us to monetize our app. Uh, and, the, and it was it was like four paragraphs long, so I cut it short a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, one obvious possibility is to do consulting work to fund the startup, but this is typically frowned upon. Mm -hmm. However, Airbnb uh, sold breakfast cereal, and this is viewed as founder hustle. Seems to be a discrepancy. What are your thoughts on this discrepancy where, you know, they, they think they can go do consulting to sort of pay the mm -hmm. bills while things are growing a little bit? Um, but sometimes people <coughs> frown upon that. What's, what's your yeah. take? Well, early on, I mean, one of the biggest problems a lot of people face in addition to building their product is running out of money. You run out of money, you're dead, right? Right. right. So 
Um, to solve that, obviously the best option is to raise money. <laughs> um, and you know, you can raise money on your story. Um, Investors, yes, they love traction. They love that you've built something and they love to see you know, user growth or revenue growth or whatever, but it is possible to raise money on this whatever story you're able to, to envision, you're able to lay out and how persuasive you are. Yeah. So my first recommendation would be try to raise money. Yeah. You have a product and you have happy users, <laughs> That's a great story. That's better than a lot of companies, yes, right? Yes, yes. So yeah. I'm not saying you're going to go out and raise 10 million bucks, but surely you can hopefully raise a, a little bit yeah. to just get you to the next level. So that would obviously be the ideal scenario. I mean, believe me, if the Airbnb guys could have raised funding, they wouldn't certainly not have sold cereal boxes. That was a pure act of desperation yeah. um, that worked out really well and is a fabulous story. Yeah. Um, but it's not something that I would never say, why don't you create some cereal boxes yeah. and sell these <laughs> When's cereals? the next election? Yeah, up, I mean, uh... that's not something you can probably re replicate. In terms in terms of consulting, it's very tempting for people to want to do consulting work to bring some revenue in. The problem is, it is distracting. Yes. And like early on, you do not want to do anything that distracts you from talking to users and building your product. Um, so I would, you know, if you're desperate, fine, do it. But try to avoid it at all costs. Um, and if you do do it, you know, put a stake in the ground and say, we're going to do this for six months and get some money in the bank and then go back to, to focusing Got on it. the product. All right. Great advice. And I, I would also say now with, you know, the advent of AngelList and, you know, there's got to be some friends and family out there who maybe can yeah. help out. Um, you should be able to raise at least 100K or 50K yeah. or something to Try to cobble through. together anything to get you through. Exactly. Do you feel comfortable going out and raising money? All right. Well, good luck. Uh, good luck with that. Um, let's move on to. Uh, we have one here from uh, Sleepless in Silicon Valley, which mm. is pretty funny. How do founders cause themselves problems through lack of self-awareness or through self-delusion? Oh, is there important advice you give to some founders but can't because you know they're too defensive to accept it? Do you have ways of breaking through that shell with founders? So I'm not sure mm -hmm. I totally understood all of that, but um, I think it's you know giving advice to people who might. <coughs> appear to be a little bit defensive so what yeah. uh, well you know that's a real problem if you're defensive as a founder um, if you don't want to accept sort of constructive advice from people who want to help you succeed you're not going to probably wind up being successful um, have we funded people like that yes um, can we help them we try um, but if you you know tell someone something that they don't want to hear, um, founders definitely are able to live in a sense of denial and like then we can't help you. Yep. Um, we can only try so much. Um, the biggest, I mean founders are in denial about all sorts of things. Where do I start? <laughs> yeah. I mean one of the, the biggest things lately that we're seeing is uh, founders sort of being in denial about their burn rate. Um, and fundraising, oh, yeah. um, and and what happens is they you know after YC they raise a seed round and and they do really well, really easy, got you know million dollars in the bank, no problem, and they go back and they start working and let's say they get a fancy office and they hire a bunch of people, all of a sudden their you know monthly expenses just shoots up, and you know let's say all of a sudden they're still working on their product and they're they're not recognizing that, God, we only have six months left of money in the bank at the rate we're going now, they don't stop and say, oh, wait, we have to change something. We either have to fire people or cut expenses or go raise money. Hmm. And they come to us, you know, with two months burn left and they say, oh, we're running out of money. We need your help. Can you help us do a Series A? And we say, like, good luck raising when you're about to run out of money, yeah. you know, because yeah. investors can sense that and you all of a sudden have no leverage. Wow. So I don't know if that's the exact answer um, to founders being in denial about things, but like, general advice is that as a founder you got to be open-minded and you got to be very honest with yourself like are users liking this product as it is are we working on the right idea yep. how much money do we have in the bank 
do we have the right team to do this? Am I the right person to be CEO? Like, you got to be open-minded. Yeah. Do you, do you, I was going to ask on the them coming back and when they're running out of money, is are you finding that like the first round is so easy that they just think, yes. oh, well, whenever we need to get some more, we just press the magic button and it shows up again. Yes, like, sorry. Is that, is that what's going on? I should clarify. The first round was so easy um, that they think, oh, the next one will be similarly easy. Yeah. And what they don't realize is that investors have a much tighter filter for that second round. Okay. They want to see growth. They want to see traction. Team Otherwise, you haven't delivered. Yeah, they d you haven't delivered on anything, yep. um, and they don't like that. Wow. <laughs> yep, you're making it too easy for these guys. You know, they're all uh, they're all getting their money. That's that's. Uh, but it, it is, you know, I I just remember sweating that all the time. Like, you know, when when you're a CEO, you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. Like, you know that. We've got 12 employees now. Mm -hmm. That guy quit his job at Yahoo. She left her job wherever, you know. They and, have kids. They, <laughs> they have kids. They need medical, you know, s somebody's pregnant and they don't want to lose their insurance. Like, yeah. there are all sorts of um, things. And, and, you know, that that would just, like, I wouldn't sleep some nights because it, mm -hmm. I'd, like, start thinking about it. And, uh, and you know, as the clock gets closer and closer you know we we got down to you know a couple months of money before we, we were mm. bought and uh it's oh it's really not, oh yeah well it was it was there's a story for you oh, answer yeah, the oh question. yeah no it's it's <laughs> uh it's it's very um uh it makes you like not feel well most of the time <laughs> so uh and and you know in in the case of tello we got we got lucky um you know part of that was going in a good direction and pivoting and going and doing something else but mm -hmm. um you know it it keeps you up at night and yeah. so if, if you're not sweating that like if everything's happy and you know everyone's partying and having fun so, something's probably gonna gonna bite you eventually so mm -hmm. um all right well let's uh let's keep going here um this one is uh is from a anonymous uh person in toronto uh, is there anything female founders should or can do to protect themselves against shady male VCs and counterparts in the industry? For example, mm -hmm. I am a female founder and I do not reply or send texts to male VCs, founders, developers after 8 p.m. It's interesting. Um, I do not allow any late night chats that can be taken the wrong way. If I'm working with this person already, it's a little bit different, but this is just one way that I protect myself. So. Interesting question from Toronto. So, what do you what do you think? Mm. Have you experienced that at um, all? Well, sadly, I'm like it's it's so depressing that we even have to talk about this. I I am familiar with uh, very inappropriate behavior on the part of of some investors. N a few examples from Y Combinator, but actually most of them are from women that I've been referred to or have been referred to me that are outside of the Got Y it. Combinator community. Um, oh, you know, it's a it's really tough. Um, what to do? I mean, what what's so tough is that like you're desperate for money, right? And there's this horrible power play and, yeah, and yeah. you know um, you know I always think like if someone starts acting inappropriately with you you do like the equivalent of like this conversations and en ended yeah goodbye yeah you know yeah. like there's no but but the women that I speak with think well you know did he do that or you know maybe I should let him invest and not say anything you know uh. it's just really um, that's awful. Horrible. Yeah. yeah, it's really awful. Yeah. And so, like, my feeling is, if you can say that's inappropriate, thank you very much. Goodbye. You know, we're not interested in having you as an investor. Yep. Um, which is hard to do when you're like really needing money to to keep your company afloat. Um, but that's kind of my my advice. No, um, and I and I've heard. Um, you know, we've had other people on the show who have talked about it as well. And and apparently stuff like this happens a lot like more more than probably gets out there <coughs> one of the mm -hmm. challenges is they can't publicly you know out these people for fear of retribution or whatever it might be and I mm -hmm. I've been in not not the exact same situation but where weird things happen in a boardroom and you, you, you want to like 
get on Twitter and like tell the world like this this person is acting improperly yeah. but but you're worried about well you know what happens if they're an existing investor or maybe somebody you know th then they're gonna blacklist you somehow and you're not yeah. gonna be able to raise your money so it, well you just brought up something important though like the men should speak up too oh, yeah. when they're around inappropriate comments oh, yeah. or behavior you know absolutely S like fuck you yeah. stop that yeah. <laughs> you know absolutely am I allowed to say that uh, absolutely Sorry. We're, we're on cable so it's, okay. all, it's all okay all right. yeah no absolutely please um, well uh, you know whoever you are in Toronto um, I, I hope that helps a little bit but I, I like that you know she's being proactive, and uh, it's it's a little sad that she has to yeah. not send texts to you know VCs after a certain hour. But um, but I think uh, uh, I think the more both men and women call this behavior out, yeah. you know, that that's what's going to change this, right? And, and I think just talking about it, like the more people who can have these conversations, and uh, you know Ellen Powell standing up, and mm -hmm. and you know really uh, I mean the that was a lot for her to go through and um, uh, independent of the outcome you know just being able to uh, call out behaviors uh, whether whether you agree or disagree with one side or the other you know at least having the conversation yeah. about it, it really got the talk going in Silicon Valley which I think is is a good thing yes talk ca talking about things and acknowledging problems is sort of the first step um, one thing we did after there there was um, an incident at um, you know one of our demo days yeah and um, we put out a notice because there are a lot of new investors coming onto the scene and we just put out a notice that said just want to let you all know we have a zero tolerance policy for any sort of harassment of the founders and like you act inappropriately you're not ever coming back to demo day and oh by the way word gets around our community pretty quickly yeah. you know and people talk and and no one's going to want to take your funding male or female Absolutely. you know no i remember i remember seeing that and i i thought good for them like sending this out i i wasn't sure if it was in response to a particular situation or if it was preventative but it sounds like it was uh you know. It was a little bit of both. Yeah, I think it's smart. Um, well, um, we are about halfway through, so we're going to take a little break here and thank our sponsors. So sit back and relax for a minute. Um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, a lot of you know that we wouldn't be able to do this without the generous support we get from our four amazing sponsors, uh, Auric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about each one of those. Um, first, I want to thank um, Mitch Zuckley and the team over at Auric. Um, they have been with us from the beginning, and uh, Mitch has been a, a big supporter of the show. And I, and I always tell founders, you know, when you're getting started, you want to have um, a, a great lawyer who is one of your earliest advisors. And yes, they're going to take care of the legal paperwork and the financing docs and the hirings and the firings and all that sort of stuff. But more importantly, um, they should be one of your most trusted advisors. They've seen way more financings and contracts and mergers and acquisitions and IPOs than you'll ever see. Uh, unless you're a lawyer yourself. So so make sure you get a great one. Uh, the team over there, uh, I've worked with on multiple companies, and um, they've always come through for me. You can go and uh, find out more on their website. It is auric.com. Um, next, I want to thank uh, our new sponsor for season two of Founderline, which is uh, Square One Bank. And I've been working with uh, the team over there for, for a number of years. Um, uh, Lori Lamenti Gardi and Sam Bomick uh, are the two people that I've worked with the most. Um, when you're when you're getting going with your company, you want to make sure you have a great financial partner. Obviously, uh, when you get that, you know, 500k seed round or two million dollar seed round or whatever it is, you want to make sure the money's safe. That's sort of um, you know the basics. But you also want a, a bank that can help you uh, and, and make your life easier. So things like online banking. Um, maybe uh, getting you a company credit card so that you're not uh, putting a bunch of uh, company expenses on your personal credit card and uh, you know someday down the road you end up with a bunch of expenses that you you know you forgot about so um, they can take care of all of that stuff for you um, you can find out more on their website as well it is squareonebank.com square the number one bank.com 
Um, we also have another new sponsor this season, which is Accretive Solutions, and they are the leading business outsourcing firm in Silicon Valley. And um, Martini is the person I've worked with. She was my interim CFO at my last company. Um, you know, I had to ask her, what the hell is business outsourcing? Like, I don't even know what that is. But um, basically, it's, it's your interim uh, CFO, your controller, um, people who handle payroll for you, accounts payable, accounts receivable, just making sure that um, your financial packages are in good shape, getting um, reports out to your investors, um, everything that, you know, it's really important to make sure this stuff is done well, but it's really important that you don't, you as the CEO or the founder, don't spend all of your time, you know, going through the spreadsheets and trying to, you know, account for every, every penny yourself. Um, they're very reasonably priced, you know, get someone who can handle that for you so you can focus on making your product great and growing your business, which are probably the, the most important things for you. Um, you can find out more at their website. Uh, the URL is as-bos.com. And then um, finally, I want to thank uh, the Ustream team. So uh, they were also a founding sponsor. And when we first got started, Brad Hunstable um, said, you know, we want to help you guys out. We want to make sure that we get Founder Line out to as many people as possible. So um, they've been supporting us uh, with, with all of their great technology, their software uh, from the very beginning. And if you're a company that's uh, doing remote meetings or maybe you have a big event that you want to uh, broadcast, uh, Ustream is the way to go. You can uh, go find out more on their website as well. It is ustream.tv. So that's uh, thanking our sponsors. Um, once again, if you have a question for us, uh, you can email us. The email address is help at founderline.com or you can tweet to at founderline. So we've got about um, 25 minutes left. Let's see if we can jump into a bunch more here. Um, let's go to uh, Dylan, who says, we are considering applying for YC. What are some of the things that stand out in the applications and make it more likely to get accepted? So the secrets of uh, getting funded mm -hmm. by YC. <clears throat> I'm sure you've never been asked this before, so. <laughs> well. Um, there's really no, it's not really a secret, but a way to get noticed when we're looking through applications is to have built something really cool. Um, we love it when founders are domain experts that are solving a problem that they themselves have. Ah. Love that yeah. because they have key insights. You know, I always get a little worried when someone's building something that is just not something that they know about, but they think, oh yeah, I've heard that's a big problem. I think I'll do that. That sounds cool. We don't have the, the deep insights yep. that someone, if they've experienced the problem, they can be their first users, you know? Yep. Um, so we love when people have the domain expertise in whatever idea that they're doing. Um, we obviously really like to see a technical person on the team. We are getting, you know, just a lot more different types of people are applying to Y Combinator. Originally, I had mentioned we were geared toward uh, CS grads. Yep. And now there are just tons of different people from all over the world, uh, all different ages, all different areas of expertise. But we really like to see someone technical on the team. Yep. Um, and not saying so at least one technical person. At least person. one technical person and okay. not someone who outsources the development of their product. Um, off somewhere because you know the technical component is an important part of any kind of startup that you're building yep. and you really want someone to be in-house you know having those insights um, um, so, executing on so them. if it was outsourced technology is that like a an immediate no oh, more or less I should qualify that we never say never okay so that is, I just want to be very clear okay. when I say like these are things we like if you don't have that that doesn't mean that we won't interview you because we interview tons of different people and okay. we always say that you know there's some rumor out there that we don't fund single founders we absolutely fund single founders oh. there's you know plenty in this batch um, the problem is with single founders, you know, it's a lot of work to do um, as one person. And also, it's just sort of a moral burden. You know, you feel very lonely at times, and it's nice to have a colleague to bounce ideas off of or yes. to say, like, oh, it's the end of the world. And your co-founder can say, don't worry, yeah. we'll get through to balance this it and out, balance right? it out. Yeah. Um, so uh, we like it when there are, you know, at least two founders. We don't like it if there are, like, six founders. Um, 
that's not to say we wouldn't fund you, but we, we tend not to like humongous groups of people. Um, we love, you know, any idea that could be huge. Um, even if you've just started on it, um, if we think it could grow into something huge, we love that. Y you don't have to have traction. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of people are talking, well, I'm not far enough along to apply to you know, to apply to YC. Well, God, we've funded ideas, just ideas all the time. Um, yes, it's helpful if you've built something, some sort of prototype and yeah. like, God, it's great if you've already launched and you have users and um, things are cooking, that's terrific. But that's not to say we wouldn't fund you if it's just at the idea stage. We're all over the place. All right, good. So it's hard to say, you know, one specific thing. We just, we really like it when it seems like the applicant has thought deeply about their problem and had like we learn things from the application uh -huh. or the interview that we had no idea um, or they have something unique that that doesn't exist that is so much better than what's already out there okay great great insights um, so Dylan I hope that helps and there's there's a related question I'm gonna jump down to okay. just because it's it's right on topic so this is from Ali who is in Pakistan so um, uh, I have two things going against me. I'm a single founder and I'm in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. What sort of traction would I need to show if I wanted to have a serious shot at getting into Y Combinator? So I think you just answered part of that, like don't necessarily need to show traction um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're not opposed to single founders, although it's better if you can find somebody. So um, mm -hmm. what, what else would you say to Ali? Well, I'd say, you know, we ask everyone we fund to move here for three months. They can certainly move back to where they're from if they would like to yeah. afterward. But, um, and we, we've, we are now funding more international founders than we've ever funded. Okay. Um, but man, is immigration a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have, you know, some founders in this batch that we just kicked off last night. Like, one of the founders won't be coming till July because, like, his, he can't get in. his immigration paperwork that three different lawyers said this is the right way to go got rejected. Because it's, it's very, it's like, the capricious person who reviews it wasn't happy with it and like so he's out he is like in YC and can't physically be here that's such a uh, until it's awful it's awful um, so that's like that's a real challenge yep. uh, getting all the proper immigration paperwork got it well so Ali you know I, I think you don't have two things going against you. you. You know, you just gotta gotta figure out a way to do it. So um, sounds sounds like uh, might might actually happen. So good luck. Hope you uh, hope you figure it out. Yeah, apply. Yeah, apply. When, when's the next? Uh, well, the next period? batch. The the great thing about YC is there's always another train coming down <laughs> the line, and our next batch is in the winter. We post application. We open up applications. I think in like late September. Okay. Um, we conduct interviews in November, and kind of the batch gets started then, and we have the first dinner in January. There you go. Yeah. All right. So good. Good luck. Um, all right. Let's go to um, Rick in San Francisco. Um, if you were to name a few of the common attributes of the unicorns that have come through YC, what would they be? So very interesting. So, you know, let's think about some of the big ones, like anything that stands out in your mind, like I knew those guys were going to make it or, you know, we had no idea, like we didn't think that was going to work out or. It's always somewhere in between. I'll tell you one thing that that always surprises people is that, um, you know, if I'm thinking back to the early days of like Dropbox and, and Airbnb specifically, um, you know, we really liked all the founders, and um, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about some of the things that they did, but it was not that, that summer or winter when we funded them that we were like, oh, they're going to be the biggest company we've ever funded. Like, we had no idea that they'd they be as big as they the, are now. One in the crowd. They were one in the crowd, and like, yes, there were some, some things in hindsight that I'd look back and say that's a good indicator, but like, we had no idea. Um, you know, it's funny, there's this famous um, exchange that, that Fred Wilson of Union Square Ventures was nice enough to allow Paul to publish, and it's about 
sort of Paul, like, basically saying, Fred, you got to meet Airbnb. It's going to take over the world. It's going to displace, you know, hotels. And Fred's like, yeah, we're not convinced. And it's this whole, like, amazing interchange in hindsight. Um, but you can tell, like, no one really knew. I mean, Paul had an inkling, yeah. but no one really knew. But uh, having said that, um, what some of the unicorns, I guess, um, had in common during YC is they were determined. <laughs> they were determined people. Hmm. Um, and they just, um, like Airbnb specifically, I remember, you know, they had to travel to New York uh, every week. Um, to, to try to, their biggest problem back then was getting hosts up on the system yeah. and helping them yeah. in create New York, nice, in New York, New York was their big market. First, okay. There was a, that, that big market. So Paul was like, I don't usually say this during YC, but you should really be in New York. So those guys would fly to New York for the week and they'd come back and they'd be the first people there on Tuesday for our dinner. And they would be, you know, talking to everyone, talking with the partners saying, here's what happened this week, here's what we learned. We took your suggestions and we found this out. They were just squeezing the lemon yeah. out of, you know, That's the awesome. juice out of Y Combinator and were so engaged, so open-minded, so determined, just you, you'd say, try this idea and you'd trust that they'd go off and run with it. Mm. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, that it's sort of like blowing air into a paper bag with a hole on the other end. You know, you can tell them things, but if they're not going to go off and test things out and sort of respond, yeah. um, we can't really help them. I call that pushing on a rope, right? You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> nothing's yeah, going to happen. Really gonna happen. Yeah. Um, and so, and the Dropbox guys were super determined too, and they were always, um, you know, new features every Tuesday night kind of thing. Oh, wow. The other thing that I was going to say was they had like this fanatical desire to like listen to their users and and they cared so deeply about their users um, that was something that they all had in common like they just wanted to make their user experience wow. wonderful that's great um, and that's you know kind of what helped them win and also they're good leaders you know you can be a great yeah. technical person or a great product person but if you can't um, grow a company to be big and be a good leader, which is learned in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, but if you can't do that, I, you're, I don't think you're going to become, you know, super big company. Yeah, that's great. And the determination one, I think, is critical because there's so many hurdles in getting a company going and the ups and downs and just uh. continuing to plow through at all costs. And um, I, I think that's it's underrated. You know, that's, that's it is underrated. And actually, when we first started Y Combinator, we didn't factor that in as an important quality in founders. We sort of said, oh, well, if they're super smart, they'll be great founders. Uh, and yeah. that's just not, not yeah. true. I'd, ta I'd take less <laughs> smart and more determined. Yeah, uh, any day. Um, and actually, one, one of, I, I love this line from Paul, like when he used to be on stage, you know, he's, he'd be like, well, there's a there's a Dropbox or an Airbnb in here somewhere. You know, you just need to figure out which one it is, right? And <laughs> of the 80 or 100 companies, and and it's hard, right? It's you know, you, so you, hard. you look at them and you go, I I'm going to be the one to find this one, right? And it's and, so hard. Yeah. It is. There's so much that goes into being the next big company. Some of it being luck, honestly. Yeah. Um, and and uh, it's it's a lot has to do with the founders, but a lot has to do with like the growth of the market and everything and the timing. Yep. All right. Um, so Rick, I hope that helps. Um, let's go. Here's a tweet from Jeff. It says, "How do you keep an investor from poaching your startup's product idea and developing it with another team, like mm -hmm. Pied Piper and Huli, uh, referencing?" The show Silicon Valley on oh, HBO. Oh gosh, this is embarrassing. I have not watched the show yet. Well, I need to. They just, I don't they have just, HBO. They just took the, you know, the <laughs> the idea and they like copied it, and so yeah. uh, you know. Well, um, that is not something I'd worry about as a founder. Um, like execution is the most important part of a startup. Like. Believe me, we have funded so many ideas at Y Combinator that I wanted to succeed so badly, and they didn't. Hmm. And it's all founder execution. Yep. Um, so I am 
I think you gain more sort of by sharing your idea um, with people and you get good feedback and, and you don't need to be super worried, especially about investors yeah. stealing your idea yeah. and giving it to someone else. I mean, of co I'm sure there's stories out there here and there, but for the most part, um, people won't steal your idea. Um, no. I mean, we always used to tell people that you know if you're meeting with someone who you might be worried about some sort of competition like tell them about the wheel and describe that and then leave out the cotter pin <laughs> you know because there's certainly going to be some unique insights yep. that you have that you, you might not need to share yep no exactly and i jeff honestly i wouldn't worry about it you should be out talking to as many people as you can um telling them about your idea getting mm -hmm. feedback and you know, I, I did actually have a VC steal an idea once, and um, uh, it was pretty pretty devastating. Really? Yeah, yeah. Tell the story. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I it's a, it's a, it's a big firm, and um, uh, but that person no longer works at the firm, so uh, they, they wow. figured it out, and they, uh, yeah, it was pretty bad. So, but, but it wasn't, wasn't like it was, you know, no one else could have thought of that. It was just sort of. Did that you know. company go on to be super successful? Uh, I'm just they're, curious. They're very successful, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Offline. No, okay. no. It, it was, it's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I end up deciding not to pursue it. But um, uh, it, it does happen. But nine times out of ten, like more than that, 99 out of 100, you should just go do what you can. Like when it, as an investor, if someone says, oh, you know, we need you to sign an NDA, you know, oh. total non-starter. Like, yeah. you know, if you don't trust me, then you don't want my money. Like, right. like why, why waste your time? Right. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's keep going here. Here's one from uh, Michael in San Jose. Uh, it says, Ellen Powell banned salary negotiations at Reddit, a Y Combinator company, in an attempt to eliminate the gender pay gap. Do women have a disadvantage when negotiating with VCs, or is that something that all nerds are terrible at, regardless of their gender? What disadvantages do women have when it comes to getting funding? How can we get more women founders? Um, are there things YC can do, which we, we talked about some of that already. So, um, so what do mm -hmm. you think? Um, if it's OK, I might speak more generally about fundraising sure. and not have it be specific to male or female. Okay. Um, fundraising is hard when you've never done it. Um, and remember, venture capitalists and investors, this is their full-time job. They're you pros. Know, they're pros. They're doing it every day. They know all the tricks. And, you know, if you're a founder, you're most likely a product person. Some people are business people. Um, but most of them are product people. And especially if they're, you know, programmers, they just might not have a lot of experience in negotiation and um you know all the little tricks yep. that you got to play when yep. when you fundraise because it's all about leverage. Absolutely, uh, it's all about that. Um, and so it's really hard. And we spend a lot of time at Y Combinator training our founders um, in preparation for Demo Day on you know all the different things that can happen and things you should keep in mind. And I mean, obviously, our first advice is have a great product, have happy users and believe that you are going to be the next Google. Because okay. <laughs> then, it, you know, if you, if you have a good product, you know, people will want to invest. Um, so that's, you know, the right starting place. But, you know, not everyone always has that at the time they need to fundraise. So there are a lot of things you need to understand before you go visit Sand Hill Road. And we bring in alumni to share their experiences. And then we, you know, work one-on-one -on -one with the founders as they're going through. We're sort of answering their questions. You know, these guys gave us a term sheet, what should we do now? And we're coaching them. Oh, okay. um, and it's very hard if you haven't done it before. Absolutely. Um, so I think it's sort of challenging for a lot of first time founders. Um, luckily, there's a lot of great information online now. Um, but, you know, my advice is to, before you fundraise, you know, talk to as many people as you can who have done it, um, founders, and can give you advice. But first, you know, first, thing is to have actually a good product. Um, from Y Combinator specifically, I think the female CEOs, um, which by the way, we are getting more of applying and we're funding more female CEOs. In the past, 
there might have been a female founder, but she wasn't the CEO, who's okay. typically in charge of the fundraising. Okay. Um, so, you know, from Y Combinator's sort of data, um, w you know, for the most part, if there's a female founder um, and she has a great product, she's gotten funding. Like one of the most successful fundraisers from last summer's batch. You know, I'm not sure if she's announced it yet, so I nervous to say anything but it was a woman I better not say her company name because I'm not sure if she's announced it but that was like the most successful venture capital raise of that summer oh wow it's a woman that's great um, so our the the data that we have is is basically like if you have a good startup you'll be able to find funding but okay. that's just why Combinator got it okay great um, let's see if we can get a few more in here um, we have uh, Jimmy in Mountain View it says uh, Bill Gross of Idealab gave a TED Talk earlier this year in which he ranked the top factors for startup success. His number one was timing, team was number two, and the business idea itself number three. What do you think about his conclusion? And more importantly, how can we tell if the timing of our startup effort is right? What do you Man, think? Timing is so hard. Yes. Timing, it is, it is very important. Um, you know, the Reddit guys, when they applied to Y Combinator, it wasn't with the idea for Reddit. It was um, ordering uh, fast food on your phone. And this was in 2005 oh, before wow. smartphones. <laughs> and we were like, guys, I don't think so. You know, yep. it's not, not happening yet. But there's they, no iPhone, There's right? no iPhone. Yeah. Um, and they were 22-year-olds and had no connections to McDonald's or any, any people like that. So timing, you know, there is something important to be said for timing. Um, I personally think it's the founders that are most important. Timing, I mean, it, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to go out and say it's the most important thing, but I found like found it's the founders you should fund more so than their idea, certainly. Hmm. Like I'd agree that idea comes third because you can change your idea and you well, can and that adjust happens your idea. All the time all with the YC, time. right? All the like time. Like fifty percent of the companies would you say change their ideas um, or twenty five percent? What what would I you would say I would say at least twenty five percent change their ideas. That's a lot. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um it used to be a little bit higher than that, but now we are getting some people who are applying a little bit later on, so they've had time to they test their eyes. They have a little something. traction, yeah. so there's less pivoting, but there's still a lot of pivoting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I would agree, I, because if you have those determined you know, founders who will do anything to make this happen, they might end up changing their idea, right? Yeah, and, they uh, might. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if I agree on the, on the timing as well. Um, so, uh, Jimmy, I hope that helps. Let's, um, I think we have time for one more. So this is from Susie. It says, thank you for your work on the Female Founders Conference. As a mom and startup founder myself, I'm wondering how you managed to fit it all in, being mm. a good employee, wife, mom, et cetera. Any tips? Oh, God. We're going to end on this because it's so hard. <laughs> First of all, thank you for accommodating my schedule. Oh, no they, problem. They're interviewing me an hour earlier than usual because no, I needed problem. to get home in time for dinner for my kids. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, and there, most days, I don't think I'm doing anything very well. Hmm. Um, t uh, tips are, you know, you got to just prioritize. My house is always a mess. My kids sometimes show up at birthday parties without birthday presents, <laughs> but you know what? My kids are happy and they're doing well in school and Y Combinator's doing well, so you just have to prioritize. I tend to not take very many meetings. I rarely, um, I, I rarely take meetings if there isn't like a real specific reason, because I just don't have the time. My sort of work day is constricted. Um, I rarely travel. For work, like I get, I, I'm so sad to have to turn down all these wonderful speaking opportunities that are in places I'd love to visit, but I'm just can't travel. Logistically, just can't too go hard. to Germany for a week. You know, yeah. it's too hard. Yeah. Um, I asked Diane Green about this um, from VMware because she, when she started VMware, she had, you know, an infant. I think she was pregnant when she started. Oh wow! And I said, how, like, how did you do this? And she gave me advice that I really liked, which is. Um, she kind of outsourced everything that didn't have to do with the kids. So she had a cook come in. She, you know, I use Instacart all the time okay. so that I don't have to spend an hour at the grocery store. Um, 
you know, have cleaners come to your house to clean you know, clean your house. Um, you know, and just try to like anything that you can offload and pay for if you can afford it, do it so that you can focus on your kids and your work. Um, but it is, you know, it's hard, and I often feel like I'm not doing either the best that I can. No, it's well, and it, it's hard for us as well, right? And uh, you know, try, trying to um, be a good partner to your spouse or whoever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that's invaluable, having somebody who supports you and, um, yes. you know. It, Paul, it, I have to say, he's the cook in our family. So all right. he cooks me dinner every night. He spends tons of time with our kids. He's just, I'm so lucky to, to have him as a partner. Awesome. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end. The hour, hour went by too fast, yes. but um, yeah. sorry if we didn't get to all your questions. We did our best, but, uh, you know, we'll... Uh, We'll take it up again soon, and we'll see if we can answer more. So thank you. Thank um, you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So um, uh, Jessica is on Twitter, and you can follow her. Her Twitter handle is Founders at Work, which is also the title of her book right here. So go buy it. Um, and of course, Y Combinator's Twitter handle is at Y Combinator. Uh, you can go find them there. Um, we're off next week, but uh, we'll be back in two weeks for another episode. Our guest will be Jason Calacanis, who is a prolific entrepreneur and angel investor. Uh, he's the founder of a bunch of companies, including Inside and the Launch Festival, and he also does a show called This Week in Startups. So it'll be good to get him on the other side of the uh, the, the table um, answering questions. Um, so it'll it'll be a great show. That'll be. Uh, two weeks, Wednesday, June 17th at 5 o'clock Pacific time. Um, thank you once again to our amazing sponsors, Auric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. You can send us questions for Jason in advance to uh, our email address, help at founderline.com, or on Twitter, or you can go to our website and submit questions there. Um, you can also go uh, check out all of our previous episodes. They're usually up the next day, and um, you can read about the upcoming guests, and you can uh, also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again in two weeks.